Beautiful Carol How back on Rebranding God. It's so good to be here with you. And I cannot wait to have this conversation about relationships with you today. Good. That's the most important kind of conversation we can have. It, I have that conversation with people all the time because there's much confusion abroad in the land about relationships. Well, thank you for using the word confusion because... I being in that place of confusion, I would say, especially in the last year or so, as I was, I've been single and then dating and now back to, to single. And I was, I just finished writing a book about, it's, let's say it's a new version of the love languages. So I was doing a lot of research, reading books on relationships and it was interesting to read the books on relationships written usually by psychologists. Mm -hmm. So books that are, yeah, the psychologists look at relationships mm -hmm. from the lenses of psychology, of course. And mm -hmm. then reading A Course of Miracles, which is also a psychology and a deep spiritual text. So it's interesting as you, you read the books on relationships that talk all about vulnerability and asking for your needs and communicating and healing your childhood trauma through the relationship. And then you read the chapters on the Course of Miracles that teach you about holy relationships that say you should want nothing. And then yeah. you read the psychology books that you have to ask your needs. So I being in that place of confusion myself, and I can't say that I'm like, oh, I got it. I think I would get it once I'm experiencing a true holy relationship with somebody. And I'm, I know the holy relationship it doesn't necessarily mean romantic relationships. And I want to focus this conversation with you, Carol, on committed romantic relationships, just to make this conversation in a way simple. And I think also that's what the biggest suffering and stress happens is on the intimate or what we call the form of committed romantic partnerships. Well, the, certainly right? the, big, the big problem is because although we would rather not admit it, we come into those kinds of relationships with our list. This is how this is supposed to be. This, this is what this relationship is supposed to look like. This is how I'm supposed to be treated and so on and so forth. All of which is ultimately doomed to failure because it's absolutely ego driven. And anything that's ego driven is going to more or less kind of throw you off a cliff before it's all over with. <laughs> I've been laughing a lot at myself. And I'm glad I'm able to bring sense of humor to this work now. As I read more and more uh, about holy relationships in the Course of Miracles, the more I laugh at myself by admitting that, oh my God, all my relationships were ego-driven. All of them. <laughs> because they're about getting something, even though that's more or less hidden. It's kind of like, we have uh, a lovely back and forth up here. And it's as if we put a little note under the table that says, by the way, this is what I expect to happen as a result of this. So it's I like am, a, a two-tiered arrangement. I am guilty of that myself, Kara. So I am very excited about clarifying some of my own confusion. And I think help a lot of people who will be listening to this conversation and especially people who study the course and probably have the same questions that I have as I read. So I'm gonna, you know, be vulnerable, ask questions on my own curiosity and also put myself in the shoes of a lot of our listeners that we're gonna be asked. So first of all, for the people who are not familiar with the terms of special relationship and holy relationship, let's start having you defining what does the course mean by saying special relationship and holy relationship? A special relationship is, as we have just made a few comments about, it's like, what am I going to get out of this? In other words, I have, uh, I have a laundry list of either disappointments or confusion or whatever. And so I have uh, requirements of this relationship. Obviously, they are by definition self-centered 
<laughs> requirements because they're about what I think I need to make myself safe and happy. Mm -hmm. So a special relationship is strictly at a personality ego level, which, as you can imagine, are bound to trip us up sooner or later. And a holy relationship comes from an entirely different premise. But I don't like to talk about it as if it's some kind of uh, unusual situation. What I want to talk about it is, okay, so we're still human beings. We're still, we have all the things we need to deal with on this planet. And, but what we need to do is reorient where we think our difficulties come from that we expect our relationships to fix. In other words, if the relationships is a fix it thing, then what's the problem? Now, I don't even have the vaguest idea how many people I've done counseling with over the years. It's a very large number. And I find that basically everyone in this very large number has an incorrect basic premise. And this is not an evil premise. It's just an inaccurate premise. And that premise is whatever my problems are, in my relationships, because after all, we're constantly relating, the other person is the problem. In other words, so uh, we therefore learn, like, well, whether it's subtle or whether it's direct, what do I do about this person who is actually the cause of the problem? The first thing we have to realize, they aren't the cause what they are, and this is just incredibly important to get, they are a mirror. Mm -hmm. They're giving me very, very valuable information about, lo and behold, what I am doing to me, what I am requiring of me, what I believe about me. In other words, but as long as we think that whatever our difficulties are, whether they're major or minor, as long as I have uh, someone else assigned as the origin of the conflict, so to speak, then I will get exactly nowhere because my basic premise is incorrect. So what I need to do is go, okay, well, this is really weird. And the reason why this setup is the way it is, I'm about to start to write a book about this because if everybody in the world is confused about this, then it seems like I need to do that. I just have too many things on my plate right <laughs> now. But nevertheless, when somebody is need, in need of counseling, I will ask them if there's a troubling person, which of course there already is. And I will say, well, um, tell me, just give me two adjectives that describes what the problem is with this person. In other words, what is it is that you don't like about them? And they might say, you know, well, they're selfish and they're um, and they're dumb <laughs> or whatever. And what I lead everybody through is a process that says, if you've got somebody in your life over here that you think is selfish and dumb or whatever, that person is um, acquainting you with unconscious guilt. Now, here's the deal about guilt. You might, and I always use a kind of a diagram of a circle that says, okay, this circle represents things that we're aware that we feel guilty about. Mm -hmm. And underneath it is a much bigger circle that represents a lot of guilt we carry that's unconscious. Now, whether it's conscious or unconscious, it still does its damage. So if I'm running around living a life and things keep not working out or people keep being uh, difficult in one way or the other, we're clueless about what actually to do about it because we're assigning the problem to something where it doesn't belong. In other words, I'm carrying guilt with me from, from a long time ago and I don't even know I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. And if anything is to be healed, I can't heal something I don't know is happening. So along comes my problem person. 
And what that person is doing is reflecting something that I actually despise about myself or blame myself for or whatever. And once I have some awareness of whatever this is, then I need to shift the origin of my difficulty or my pain from my mirror over here to something that I believe that I need to become aware of so that I can let it go. You can't let go of something you don't even know exists. So the problem people in our lives actually are just our salvation because they're helping me get into what I don't know is there. Once I know, then I can take corrective steps. Does that make sense? 100%. Well, so you know. I'm, I want to bring a scenario. So a lot of people, people, including people that I know, are coming out of relationships that they name relationships with narcissists. And when we present the concept of mirror, which I get it completely. I have done so much here in the last year by attracting people into my life. And because I embody this work, every time I have, I had a challenge with, with the beloved, I would sit and always ask, how am I participating in this problem? And it was always very healing and revealing to myself to know that part. Mm -hmm. So that's the salvation you're talking about. Now mm -hmm. let's transfer this to people who are coming out of relationships that they feel they were take advantage, they were abused, and the so-called narcissists, which is a big word these days, mm -hmm. I think overused. So bring these concepts to them now. What is that person who is seeing herself, let's say, as a victim of the narcissist? What, what is the narcissist mirroring back to them? Their own narcissism. After all, Their own narcissism. Wow. Yes, it's like yes. mirrors only reflect what's in front of you. When you stand in front of your bathroom mirror, you never expect to see something in the mirror that you don't have on. Wow. And you, I mean, you're very, very clear that what's in a mirror is going to be an exact replica of what you've got on. But this is a case of the problem of we're actually carrying guilt about stuff that we're not aware of. In mm. other words, just as soon as somebody in a very self-righteous way says, oh my gosh, that person is such a narcissist and they're so messing up my lives and so on, tells you that they're totally unaware of the way relationships work. Mm. Now, they're not being stupid or anything like that. This not means they've got a low IQ. It means that the guilt is unknown to us. We literally can't see it. We see it out here, but we have no awareness that this person is a mirror and not a great big nuisance. So once I can start to claim and start to ask, could I, could I possibly be self-centered? Mm, <laughs> yeah. Most people are taught to be, that's what narcissism is. It's like, it's all about me. Yep. And what we need to know is, well, if we're all carrying guilt around with this, where did this come from? Mm -hmm. Well, here's where it comes from. The very brief version of where it comes from. Until we're three, about three years old, the left brain, which is the thinking brain that allows us to make these kinds of observations is physically present, but not online yet. Mm -hmm. The only thing that's online is my right brain. My right brain then in my early three years, let's say, is having experience, but no language is associated with it because language is a left brain function and it's not available at this point. Mm -hmm. So we uh, kind of build into our fundamental sense of self things about ourselves because we have no ability to accurately assess 
what's happening in our lives, what the motivations are of the parents or the caregivers or the siblings or the neighbors or the anybody else that we're um, it, dealing with. So we uh, automatically and in an unaware state, so to speak, conclude things about ourselves. And they're a hundred percent incorrect, but because I don't know any of this is happening, once I get to be about three and I have a left brain and I start to build an ego self, I incorporate into this ego self beliefs about myself that aren't true. But because of the timing of things, I have no earthly reason to know that they aren't true. I, they, I, they just seem like, well, this has always been around. This must be the way it is. And the, the two kind of most common things that I hear people say that they realize that they think are true about themselves, that they glean from this early experience, is that they're unworthy or undeserving. Yep. Those are the two most commonly used words. Mm -hmm. And nobody has come along to go, oh my God, guess what? You are as beloved and clean and pure as the new driven snow, or whatever the saying is. You just incorporated some beliefs that you had no capacity to examine. And so various characteristics that you, negative characteristics that you attribute to yourself are basically a big lie and they're hurting you and you don't realize it. Yeah. And, and so what obviously needs to be done is the things that we believe about ourselves that are inaccurate, and painful they're you know they when we think we're guilty of being this way then we inflict punishment upon ourselves then along comes person b out here with an exact replica so to speak if you can imagine of what we fear about ourselves it's not the truth of ourselves but we don't know that so what this person does is kind of bring this belief about myself that I think is the truth about myself up into conscious awareness where with the correct information, I can let it go. Now, what might be the correct information? Well, for starters, every single one of us are taught that somehow all the things that have happened in my past are like all piled up behind me over here. <laughs> and the longer I live, the larger this pile gets of the things I do well and also my transgressions for which I should be punished. And so the older I get, as long as I believe this entirely, totally false notion of things, I'm going to believe that the things about which I am guilty just you know, they follow me like an ever larger pile. Well, the past is not stored. Mm -hmm. See, even the sentence that we said two seconds ago and everything that happened in our lives before that, it just like it falls off the edge. Mm -hmm. So that this moment, and this is our salvation, this moment is the only moment there is. There is no past. Nothing is stored and there is no future. And in this past, or in this in the present moment, it's like a brand new clean slate, brand new. I am absolutely clean in this moment because I'm not doing anything to hurt myself or anybody else right in this moment. Mm -hmm. And if I can keep the idea that I have a whole bunch of past awful stuff that I have to manage, so to speak. And often it's to bury it uh, then, because as long as I have that belief, I'm sort of sunk. So I have to have some idea of how life actually operates. And so how it actually operates is this moment is all there is. Mm -hmm. And in this moment, I only have two choices. So this is getting to be simpler and simpler. Mm -hmm. In this moment, 
I can either be egocentric, I can be involved in the promotion and protection of my sense of ego self, or I can follow my intuition and decide to be truly helpful. End of story. One of those, the promotion protection part, is how we, you know, manage to kind of wreck our relationships. And um, that's never going to work out well. On the other hand, if I follow my intuition and, and, and really wish to be as loving and open as, and helpful as possible, my life is going to get better and better and better and better. And at any moment, and we thought, well, listen, I've got to take care of number one. I've got to really take care of this ego person thing that I think I am. And I've got to escape from these people and try to get these people. And it's always a kind of a getting thing. I'm constantly trying to make this ego thing safe and uh, serve me, if you will, as I go through life. In other words, it's supposed to uh, allow me to be safe and loved and everything else. So it's like, Oh, so all of our basic premises on which found, on which relationships are built are, are all over the map, but they aren't accurate. <laughs> so it's oh. like, I've got to have this accurate picture of how life really works, or I'll just run around in circles until I drop dead. Hmm. What do you think about that? Oh, wow. Well, first of all, I want to go back and give an example what you said about the mirroring. I remember a few years ago, I was in a relationship for four years with somebody who was very angry, let's say, with a lot of like past grievances, a lot of unresolved trauma. Mm -hmm. And when she would express all that anger on me, it felt abusive, it felt aggressive. And finally, after four years, I ended that relationship. And I remember being talking to my teacher that time, my therapist, and I said, I don't understand what is wrong. I could understand how I could have attracted somebody angry because I was like, not me. I'm not an angry person. I have no anger. And then <laughs> thank God I had an incredible teacher that works from the space of love and intuition. She's like, there's anger in you. But it was yeah, so say, let's revisit this. <laughs> it was so unconscious, Carol, because I was that my ego compensated by being this overly positive person. Mm -hmm. It was so unconscious that actually that relationship, that mirror gave me one of the best gifts I could have. It saved me because it it uh revealed all the unconscious anger that I had that I didn't know. You've just said a very brilliant and important thing. It's like, thank God for this person yes. who showed up and showed me how I am undermining my own life. And I didn't even know it because of the problem of so much of what drives us is unconscious. Yeah. And so it's like, if we can... Uh, recognize this and it's not like this is in the very beginning is easy to do no. but it gets to be a piece of cake after you've done this for a while because you realize it's what's being revealed like being an angry person is not the basic truth about us <laughs> in other words what's being revealed is a falsehood well, guess what? If I'm carrying around a falsehood that's creating difficulties for myself, I want to know about it so I can set it aside. Yeah. So it's like life is conspiring, even through what we consider the difficult relationships to inform us about what's going on with us so we can make wiser and wiser and more adult and more loving decisions. So the every, and as we let go of the things that we believe that aren't true, it's like miraculous things happen. It's like when we change, this is the thing that amazes us. We change our minds and we think we're doing this in the privacy of I'm changing my mind and the other people around us get to be different. One of my very 
favorite examples in one when I was a brand new, I was either a brand new course student or I hadn't even started it yet, but and I, but I'd read a bunch of other stuff when the course came along, so I wasn't entirely ignorant about how all this works. My boys were little, maybe they were five and seven or four and six or something, and um, we had a next door neighbor with three kids, and the youngest was a boy, and he was a perfectly nice boy, but he was about six or seven years older than they were, and he was a big kid anyway. So he'd climb over the fence, six foot fence, and they'd wrestle around in the yard, and somebody would get hurt, not because he was deliberately doing this, but because the size difference more than anything else. And then one of them would start to cry. And then I would run him off and say, you can't play here. You're too big for the kids. Well, this would happen over and over and over again. It's like, what's the matter with this picture? And then one day I thought, I wonder if I think I'm too hard on my kids, not wrestling around in the grass, but maybe I'm too hard of them. Maybe I expect too much. Maybe I'm not doing this parenting thing very well. Mm -hmm. So once I looked at that question and then sort of answered my own question and said, well, I might be making mistakes, but I am doing everything I possibly know how to be the best mother I know how to be to my kids. It's as if with this internal conversation, uh, I let myself off the hook, so to speak. In other words, I reduced this from a crime to a mistake, if you want to look at it that way. I want you to know that after months of this, the very next morning, he never came over. I hardly ever saw him again because of the six foot fence between our yards and they were on the corner, their driveway went out that way. I went, it was like, he was never in my line of vision. And as his older sister was our primary babysitter, as she went off to college and he grew up, I would have him come over in that when they weren't quite old enough to stay by themselves. Maybe they were 11 or 12 or something. They were now the age he had been in the beginning of all this. So I would have him come over and be the babysitter and life worked out wonderfully. But it worked out wonderfully, not because I tr because my trying to change it at the outer level was getting me exactly nowhere. Nowhere. But the moment I changed my mind internally, that from the next day on, no problem. Now, there's a big lesson to be learned from that. Yeah. So is it correct to say when in... in I have experiences myself. I'm, I, I have this knowing that if I, if there's a problem in my relationship with somebody, instead of focus on changing them, I'm gonna focus on changing my mind, absolutely, my, my absolutely. perception. And what I see, two things will happen from that. Either my relationship is going to change and it's going to turn more a holy relationship. Mm -hmm. Or something I have experienced in the past, that relationship changed form because all of a sudden I am shifting, I'm changing. Let's say I'm going from a place of fear to a place of pure presence and love. Mm -hmm. And that relationship changed form because all of a sudden there's no resonance with that fear. If I attract somebody who carries a lot of fear, mm -hmm. if I'm not carrying that fear anymore, there's no resonance. So is it correct to also say that when we really give our relationships to Holy Spirit, a miracle is going to happen. A lot of times that miracle means a dissolution of the form of that relationship. Certainly. Naturally. <laughs> that, was, that was in a certain way what happened with this boy. In other words, he vanished yeah. when he was no longer an accurate mirror to yeah. what I was carrying around and fearing myself. Yeah. In other words, it's like I didn't, but all my attempts to make the outer be different while yeah. the inner was still the same, right. which is what we try to do. It's like, I'm trying to make the outside world and this other behavior be different while I'm doing nothing whatsoever to change the right. internal pattern. Yeah. Well, I share this story because number one, I want people to take away that you don't do this work so you can 
possess, you can have the outcome that you want. It's interesting. I experienced this twice in, in, in my life where my relationship was having so much challenge that I asked spirit for a miracle. Twice this happened, Carol. The same day, these two relationships in a way dissolved. There is what we call a breakup. When mm -hmm. I asked for a miracle, the relationships shifted. They were mm -hmm. no longer in the form of romantic relationships. So I was mm -hmm. like, wow, it's, and that's the miracle a lot of times because it's just not serving, or I, I don't want to use the, it's not serving in a way, serving the ego, but it's not in, no longer in alignment with, with exactly. love. Ex so exactly. You're, you're just not on the same wavelength in a right. little way. Right. Nobody's good, bad, better. No. Different. It's just, you're not in harmony with one another. Correct. I like to use the word resonance. Like we're just not in the same resonance. We, it's exactly. not, it's nobody's fault and nobody's good or bad. So I just think that's an important component to share because this is not necessarily about miracle. It's always going to serve your highest and greatest good. It, uh, and sometimes it's going to come in a form of a, the solution, like you and I had a conversation our last podcast, that when you start doing this work, a lot of things in your life might break down because what is not truth is going to start breaking down. And that's how I see what is not truth, because this is a deep commitment to truth, is going to, to go away, you know. <laughs> and, well, what, and, 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 and thank goodness, like, yes. why would we want uh, anything to remain it's not in alignment with, uh, you know, remember miracles or, you know, somebody asked Bill, like, what's that? And it's like, it's that shift in perception, mm -hmm. you know, the change in the way we see things yeah. that allows us to see the presence of love is actually there. Yeah. In other words, it's like, it's not waving a magic wand. And no. although, you know, sometimes things really are quite stunning, but that's not the point. The point is so that, I can be assured that both I myself at the core of my being is love itself. And so is everything and everybody else. In other words, and when that becomes your goal and it becomes your goal that whoever you're with, you want them to know that. You want to talk to them in such a way that you're conveying, I'm safe in your presence. I enjoy talking to you right here for five minutes, whether it's strangers, whether it's people you know well, it doesn't matter. It's that constant conveying to whoever you're with, I'm safe in your presence and I appreciate you. Yeah. Not for anything in particular, just for existing. Yeah. And, and the more you decide to do that, the more your life just lights up, doors open before you even know you want a door to open. Things just fall in your lap. You know, you get the phone calls, you get the messages, somebody shows up in your life so that when you're kind of locked into that channel, you know, you've got one or two choices. You can be egocentric or you can be, I'm here to be truly helpful. Well, once you've been at this long enough that you really do honestly want to stay in the, I want to be truly helpful lane, if you want to look at it that way, then I don't have to ask for specifics. It's like, they'll show up before I even have a chance to ask, right. which That's is just right. amazing. Yeah. And it all has to do with where we are putting our attention because we haven't appreciated the power of where we put our attention. Yes. So when we put our attention on being upset with somebody over here because they're not behaving the way we think they ought to, it's like we're going to stir up some distress for ourselves. Not because you deserve it, but because that's the natural outcome of what you're doing. <laughs> Everything we do and think and say has consequences. So the more I do this work, the more I catch my ego when I have an agenda, I might be saying something very sweet and nice mm -hmm. that can go what we call wrong. And, and then when I see later, I'm like, 
huh, was there an agenda behind those nice words? And usually when a drama was created, I always find that it's like the ego kind of snuck in into the conversation. It's like, oh, you had an agenda. That was a, a manipulation. That wasn't just a, a love okay. request. It, it is amazing, the contrast now. Now, mm -hmm. Kara, I want to ask you this, because I, I'm sure you work with a lot of clients in this situation. I certainly do. And their friends experiencing this. I experienced this not long ago. Let's say we are doing this work. We have this language. We have this awareness. And we are sitting with our beloved who is in deep state of, let's say, depression, anxiety. In other words, they really, really caught in fear. Mm -hmm. And I certainly have approached that not in the best way before, which was trying to rescue the person, which I learned very quickly. That's not the way. So in this work, when we really want to show up in the most helpful way and build a holy, a holy relationship, what can we do at that moment when that beloved is completely hijacked by fear without offending them at the same time. Because if I say at that moment, your fear is not real, it's going to piss them off even more. That's oh, of course. I mean, <laughs> that that is going to be as unhelpful as anything I can imagine to, right. to denigrate what they're experiencing, you know, as irrelevant or something like that. This is where you learn to trust your intuition. Mm. When you really do want to be helpful to somebody who is in some level of distress, the presence of love in you, if you tune into it, is going to know whether it's to leave them alone, to say, would you like to go have a cup of coffee? Or, or, or is there anything you want to talk about? Or shall we go skiing? Or <laughs> it's like, who knows what it's going to be? Yeah. But, the, but the wisdom that is inherent in guidance knows. Yes. So our job is to just kind of follow that sense of things, whether it seems to make sense or be reasonable or whatever, that's the direction you want to follow, not something that our ego mind thinks, you know, this is what I would like under these circumstances, because yes. that might be what is helpful to somebody else or not. It's so easy to do. It's yeah. such a conditioning in us to do that. Yes. Um, that was a beautiful, I love that user intuition and the presence of love in me, because it's that presence of love that can be a miracle for that person at that moment, of nothing course. else. Of yeah. course, of course, when you're, you, you might say anchored in your own awareness that all is well, actually, you 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 become a kind of a calming presence. Yes. And you may not realize that, but nevertheless, that is how that can work. But above all things, trust your intuition. Yeah. And sometimes you're into it's, it's like when I get into an intuitive sense, and it doesn't matter what the subject matter is about, it doesn't matter if it's with people or a project or whatever it is. I, I call them my guidance telegram. They kind of enter from like the left-hand side and kind of move across my awareness. And often I'll go, you want me to do what? And I'm likely to talk out. I remember when along comes the message, it said, record all the lessons with commentary. And I remember saying out loud to like nobody in the room but me, like, do you have any idea <laughs> how long it's going to, hundreds of hours to do this? Yeah. Record the lessons with commentary. <laughs> it's like, it's just, so it can be about a project. It can yeah. be, I have a great deal of experience with intuition, just giving me assignments or knowing kind of what to do in any given situation. And it's, you see, you're not going to know what to do in any given situation unless you're being present, present in the situation. But if we're all worried about how am I showing up? Do I look good or whatever? But if you have the goal of, I want the person that I'm talking to, to know that they're not guilty, 
I'm not in any way afraid of them. I'm right here for them. That that was a goal I had experimented with a very long time ago, about in 1986, during the height of the Cold War with the Soviet Union. And a batch of us went over there as like a, on a citizen diplomacy mission. How that happened is too long a story. But I had a goal when I went over there that every single Russian person I talked to, I was going to keep in my mind and convey to them, you're not guilty. Because after all, you know, we're on the verge of destroying the world over this big war that we're you get the cold war that can morph into a hot war it was worse than it is now and it was absolutely magical it was just amazing when you make a decision that this is what i want for this person is to know that they're valuable and they're good and they're innocent and i don't mean innocent like a baby who doesn't know anything but they haven't done any harm and it was simply astounding. I broke all the rules. I did all the stuff you weren't supposed to do. It's like, don't talk to anybody in uniform. So ah. I made sure I did. Beautiful. I marched myself right up to the guards at the gates of the Kremlin because they had gates across them at the time and practiced my Russian on them. And they were just adorable. They were friendly and they were fun and they tried to be helpful. And we exchanged a little English and Russian back and forth, very primitive, but we're the ones who set the stage. So when we decide, wow, I want this person to know that they're valuable and I like being here and I wanna be helpful to them. And I'm unafraid of whatever it is that's going to come out of this interaction they're going to be fabulous. Beautiful. So this makes me think of what a lot of relationship psychologists, coaches talk so much about boundaries this day. You got to set boundaries. You know, if somebody is talking to you this way or that way, you set boundaries. Let's translate this to what you just share. If I'm going each encounter, I'm going to just be with an open heart as helpful, as loving as I can be. Mm -hmm. And there is a projection coming towards me. Let's say that person starts falling into judgment or projecting her anger. I mean, I know the chances that that project is going to happen if I'm in a space of pure love in the present are much lower. And would you say yet it's possible to happen? And if it does, how can we bring these teachings into that moment? If somebody is being less than loving to us, the first thing we have to remember, I'm the author of this. I'm Whether I realize it or not, I'm handing them the script. So mm. the first thing we have to do is stop pretend. See, the boundaries notion says the difficulty begins out here. And so I've got to protect myself mm -hmm. from what may be a difficult encounter. Well, that is absolutely incorrect. The whatever the the way I'm treated by this person originates with me. Yeah. Period. So there's or something in me that yeah. that attracted that. That's what you absolutely, said. absolutely. Yeah. So if I've got somebody who's misbehaving out here or treating a person unkindly, then I'm the author of that. There's some part of me that thinks I deserve to be treated unkindly, mm. or and so on and so forth. So, so the idea of boundaries is based on an absolutely false premise, which is the trouble begins out here. Wow. with this troublesome person. The trouble begins in here. So if I lessen the problem here, what do I need boundaries for? It would never in a million years occur to me to go anywhere in public or any place I go and go, oh my God, I've got to really protect myself from these people. In other words, it's like, no. Yeah. I think we, we, we're missing the target because I, again, I've done so much research in relationships in the last year, and also the messages on social media, the, the the quotes and the memes, all about boundaries and asking for your needs. So it's 
there are a lot of misperception. We it's 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 what I call the pendulum effect. We went from relationships and nobody spoke the truth, nobody revealed anything. Going from this place now that is the extreme of I'm gonna speak the truth, I'm gonna set boundaries, and I'm not gonna accept this behavior, that behavior, that's not negotiable. So it's like it's going to the opposite way. And you have yeah, to look clarify. At this, look at the craziness of saying boundaries and then I'm not going to accept that behavior as if the behavior begins out here. It does oh, not. Right. The yeah. behavior begins in here. So don't talk to them. Talk to you. It's like, what's going on with me here? What, in other words, what am I so defensive about? What am I worried yeah. about? What am I afraid of? Et cetera, et cetera. So you want to go to the very opposite of, see, setting boundaries says you're either the villain now or you are potentially. In mm -hmm. other words, I have some reason to think you can cause me harm or that you want to cause me harm, et cetera, et cetera. We want to do exactly the opposite, which is I no more have need of boundaries than I need of flying out the moon because I can decide that everybody is a friend. I can decide how I'm going to treat everybody. So it's like, why in the world would I want to ruin things by setting a boundary? Now, don't you think that's weird? <laughs> wow. I, I'm just like, I'm loving this conversation so much. And yes, we need your book because I think, again, this is, we feeding the ego even more with this different teachings. They sound better, but they're not necessarily the teachings that we really need. And all I hear you saying, and it's the teachings of the entire Course in Miracles, it's really about dissolving this archetype of the victim completely. It just, <laughs> it just, it's just, there's no room for victim at all. <laughs> it's like because, because victimhood is an assault on other people. It says, you're the villain. I yeah. blame you. My pain is your fault. Yep. You're the guilty party. Now we have to remember whatever gifts we give to others, we experience. So now if I'm going to give the gift of guilt to a bunch of people out here, yep. You can count on your own guilt level yep. getting larger and larger and larger, and your life will get worse and worse and worse because guilt is a request for punishment and you will always be answered. Yeah. So can you see the horror story you set for yourself once you turn other people into the villains and the origin of your distress? You've, you've just blown it all out of the water, but happily you can change your mind at any moment and turn all this around. And you can, you can, uh, instead of protecting yourself from people, you can engage in an outreach. I used to, I've used this example a couple of times. I was at the grocery store a, a few weeks ago and there's a fire department right across the street from the grocery store. So obviously firemen go to the grocery store. So on that particular day, here are these, and they're the big, I'm short and they're great big giant people. So here are these four firemen back here uh, and they've stopped as if they're not sure where they're going to go next to get whatever's on their list. So I said, hey, you guys, I need to talk to you. And it's like, hey, you guys, I need to talk to you. <laughs> they're so tall. And I said, I need to tell you that I am the greatest fan of firemen of all time. I told them why. And they, so firemen really did quite literally save my life. And I, and they were just as intent as possible. And one of these great big guys up here, this little tear starts to run oh, down his face that somebody beautiful. really yeah. um, appreciating them for the work they do every single day. And, and you can find all kinds of ways to, I have a whole bunch of grocery store stories. It's like, I, you know, I was checking. You I don't, shared a couple in our last episode. I love it. It's, so, it's like, this, this is very fast, but it's an example of something. It's like, 
I don't do that scanning thing. You know, I go through where they actually do your groceries. And so I sort of know who the people are. And as it came to be my turn, there are people in front of me. The guy who's the checkout guy is shaking mm. with, and I said, what has happened? And he said, my house was robbed last night. Oh. And he said, and I feel like I'm going to cry. So I went right into therapy mode. I said, as soon as you get out of here, allow yourself to cry. Don't hold it in. I mean, this all took place just in a couple of minutes. And he was so upset about all of his money was stolen. So I gave him $100. I said, you need to have something in your pocket and you need to go home and you need to cry. Now, all of that took a very short period of time, but I could watch a kind of uh, a kind of relief come over him. So the, we're constantly being presented with ways that we can be assuring to people, we can be grateful to people, we can compliment them on what they're doing. And the more this becomes our purpose for our relationships is giving to them what's going to enrich their lives, we are doubly enriched. I love that. So <clears throat> let's bring back to the contest, the context of partnerships here, Carol. So the whole concept of holy relationship says want nothing. Now I'm like, okay, how do I reconcile want nothing when at the same time in this body form, we have desires. So how do we reconcile this concept of desire and wanting nothing in our Be, Because it, it's not that if you want nothing, you will have nothing. It's that you have to understand how the system works, that when you want, whether it's love, goodwill, or whatever for, for your partner, let's say, Remember, the thought is in your mind. In other words, let's say you've now got a thought, I really want my partner to feel cared for and noticed and that I appreciate everything about him or her or whatever. Remember that the thought for them, because it's also in your mind, accrues to you. It's the most efficient situation in the world. So that if I want well-being and laughter and fun and goodwill and happiness and success for my partner, you're going to get the same dose. Okay. Not it's an easy way to say, if I want more affection, be affectionate. Be affectionate. Got it. If, that if, that if makes you, complete sense to me. If you want to be if you feel like nobody listens to me, you better take a look and say, well, how good are your listening skills? Whatever you want to experience from somebody else, yep. you offer what you offer, you will receive. Yeah. So you don't have to negotiate and it's like slip a little thing under the table. This is what I really expect from you. Yeah. Like all of that old stuff that, we have all learned is totally pointless and it gets you nowhere yeah. because, because first of all, the notion of I need this from you is also telling you it's, it's saying to yourself over and over and over again, I don't have, I yeah. don't, I don't have, it's like, who wants to say that? Yeah. It goes back to that scarcity which i think is the root of all this attachments is exactly. this place of lack and i need you to feel that place of lack in myself Absolutely. which is all about either i'm not good enough or i don't have enough exactly and if you think you don't have enough love it's like well <laughs> then start giving it start to giving. everything and everybody and uh, whether they're corporal and in front of you or whether you're just thinking about them, it's like offer them what you want to experience because to do otherwise is to completely not understand how life works. Yeah. It's in your mind 
it doesn't matter if you think it's for them or for them or for you or for it, it happens to you. Yeah. So when you decide as you walk through your day, I want to interact with every single person I meet to let them know I am safe in your presence. Mm. Let me tell you something important. The, the communications expert people, and I'm talking about not communicating like I'm doing teaching, but communicating at some other level. They'll go, okay, the words that we speak make up, like I'm going to say something to you, make up about 7% of what we convey to them. Mm -hmm. And then there's another um, 20, 23% or something like that, that convey through facial expressions, body language, tone of voice. But about 70% of what we're conveying to somebody else is just what's in our energy field. That's right. And you can't um, make that not be the case, in other words, so that if you're conveying goodwill and I care about you and I wish you well and so on, then this is an am amazing win-win for everybody. Yeah. If I've got the energy of, I've got you penciled in as potentially the villain, and I've got to really keep my boundaries. My in, in other words, I we might think, well, I'm not saying those words to them so they don't know. Oh, for heaven's sakes, yes, they do, <laughs> because so much of our of what we convey is not verbal. Yeah. So we've really got our head got our head straight about this and understand these laws that work whether we know about them or not. So it's our mission to know what they are. Like what I want for someone else is what I receive. Yeah. That that other people's uh being difficult in our lives, they're coming on a mission of mercy actually to mirror to us what we're doing to ourselves, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. Uh this makes me think a second uh point that I'm seeing. It's the big topic these days in relationships. Safety is this whole conversation about having this expectation that the person I am with is needs to make me feel safe. So yes. there's all these books now and strategies about like, you know, how it's my responsibility to make somebody safe in a way. And, and then you, you can get attacked sometimes by, you know, when somebody says, well, you know, this conversation really doesn't make me feel safe. I don't feel safe. And then people go into their fight or flight. And then I'm left like, wow. So um, it goes back to what we were speaking earlier about my responsibility to look at myself of why I am not feeling safe in the presence of this person, which has nothing to do with the person. I mean, if it's a dangerous situation, yeah, get out, run. But usually that's not the case. Exactly. So now we have all these studies and books that are speaking about nervous system regulation, how to regulate our physiology. And there's place for them. I understand that now all these books that are out there to help people, including the book that I just wrote, I, in a way, a bridge for some people to get to a course in miracles because a lot of people are not ready to go straight to this teaching. For me, mm -hmm. I can just read this book and, and replace every single relationship book right now for me. And yet, there are a lot of people that are going to need a process, mm -hmm. a traveling, in a way, process, a bridge to get to this kind of teaching. So I think I'm not here discrediting any of these books because again i just wrote a book you know in love languages and i wrote mm -hmm. even that your energy is the loudest voice in the room i even was very clear i said i'm gonna give you a lot of words here mm -hmm. but it was interesting i finished the book writing about god and at the end of the the, the final thoughts of my book was about okay it's going to get to a point that you're going to feel so much love. If you do this work, this spiritual work, you're going to feel so much love that you can forget all these languages that I just taught you because you're going to act from your intuition. And from that place, 
only loving words are going to come from you. People are going to feel safe around you. So it's almost like we need all these methods to get us to a place until we don't need any the methods anymore. Because yeah, exactly. body. Well, you, I'd say wanting to be truly helpful is a method, but it's a very generic method. Yeah. Yeah. In other words, it's like, and pretty soon that becomes just built in. In other yeah. words, you don't have to get up in the morning like, now what is it I'm supposed to do to, with people today? <laughs> <laughs> Let me rehearse how I'm going to have that conversation, exactly. right? Exactly. You just know that life's going to present you exactly the people to whom you need to be kind today. Yeah. Okay, yeah. well, let's see. How much trouble is that? Exactly none. This wow. is There's no effort. There's no issues. There's no anything, in other words, except once we have it, very, once we're very clear that following our, inti- our intuition and wanting to be helpful are the guideposts then everything else is going to fall into place. I continue to be astounded at, it's like I get answers to things before I even know I have the question or things are perfect before I even know it. It's like out here, I I recently moved to Denver. I lived here a very long time ago, Mm -hmm. but about 30 something years. So I'm now back. I'm now in a completely refurbished condo that belonged to my late husband and my boys now own it. And when I look out this window, the building across the street, it's a two or three story condo, is painted the exact color that matches my furniture. So oh, that, wow. So that when I look out here, it's like it's like life arranged for the colors to be beautiful together, not like red brick or painted brown or white or something. It's like it's the perfect color. And it's like, I notice that all the time. It's like life arranges for things to be artistically beautiful. I'm kind of an artist at heart. And I didn't have to ask. I didn't have to ask the, the there's a, a curtain on my patio out behind the turquoise curtains. And I found it and they exactly match my dining room chair cushions. And it's like, <laughs> it's like you just run around being grateful for how life works in your favor. And you don't even have to ask, like, could you please make the colors around me match? I love it. That's do anyway. <laughs> Carol, if somebody, is, that, is, is it accurate to say, if somebody holds the past, a lot of grievances, guilt, anger, sadness, grief, you name it. Is it accurate to say, unless they're willing <clears throat> to really atone, forgive themselves, it won't be possible for them to create a holy relationship? Is that right to say? That sounds like a statement. Are you asking a question or making a statement? It's a statement. Okay, and your statement, see, Keep in mind that every new moment is a clean moment, that you're literally creating a new set of circumstances at every moment. So it doesn't matter how off track we've been about relationships or anything else up until now. So that if now I decide I want to be generous, I want to be loving, I want to learn how to listen, I want to uh, be as helpful as I can with whatever it is that kind of arrives on my plate at this moment, you won't have to worry a thing about whatever happened in the past. And this is not a great, big, long, complicated thing. You just mm-hmm. keep those things in mind. And this current moment is always going to be an accurate reflection of what your thought processes are yeah. in this moment. So just keep yourself in a loving helpful, appropriate. Uh, I want to be here to be truly helpful and stay in this moment mindset. And then everything will just fall into place. You don't have to do any extra orchestration, so to speak. So this is really about the holy instant. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And because everything really is 
a holy instant. We just have to recognize, we just have to own that, so to speak, or we have to become aware of it through these things of being helpful and being loving and being non-judgmental and so on. So you might say there's always a holy instant, but we've got to tap into it. Yeah. And that's the challenge because we might choose sometimes to, and, and like you said, it's always a gift, but we might choose sometimes being with somebody who may describe themselves as carrying a lot of trauma from the past. They have a lot of healing to do, they might say, and they're not, they might not be able to show up in full presence at, at that moment. And what you're saying is like, well, that's not my problem. I choose to show up in my intuition, in love at that moment and okay. let the rest unfold. And if they choose to show up, it doesn't matter what their past, what their grievances are. That's what you're saying. Of course, of course yeah. it doesn't matter at all. Yeah. And as long as we uh, you know, stick with, I have my work that I have to do, and that work is going to ultimately be the most helpful to whoever I'm with because yep. I've got the interests in mind and and et cetera, et cetera, like we've said before, so I won't repeat it. But um, we're always in the driver's seat. We don't ever have to worry about accommodating ourselves to others or others are going to override us or whatever anybody else is doing. They're just showing us what we need to be taught or to, to be shown so that we can make the changes that we need to make. Now, yeah. nothing about this is about blame or wrongness or anything else. It's just that we all end uh, by the time we're, you know, an adult, 22, 23 years old, we have incorporated beliefs that are incorrect. We haven't ruined ourselves, but we do carry baggage with us that's unhelpful. And the problem people, quote unquote, in our lives are going to parade through our lives, revealing to us what those unhelpful beliefs are about ourselves or others, kind of bring it up into our awareness so we can make a different choice and let it go. Yeah. So that the things that trouble us get to be less and less and less and less and less and less and less. And less. Yeah. I, can't, I can't honestly think right now of anything that I find troubling or that worries me or that I don't know what to do about or something like that. So when you're not wasting a bunch of horsepower worrying about something or trying to stay safe, you open up all this awareness for your intuition to guide you because you're not contaminating the space with Oh my gosh, well, look what this neighbor did. And what am I going to have to do? Am I going to have to put up a wall, uh, et cetera. So I just keep changing my mind and problems vanish. It it does vanish. I want to, if I may, um, before I ask my last question to you, I'll share a little story about three days ago. Um, my ego was having a little party inside me by going into blaming and, and being angry at this particular person. And I catch myself. And now when I catch myself in that place, the, the, the suffering is, it's, it's palpable because it's such a contrast. Mm -hmm. It's like, Oh my God, it's almost like I have this thing and I don't want it. It's like, I don't want these thoughts. I don't want this judge judgments about this person. I can feel my entire body suffering that moment. So now mm -hmm. when, what I do, I did that three days ago and I'm sharing this because it's such a moment of miracle is that shift of perception. Mm -hmm. I sat down to meditate and I start asking Holy Spirit, I don't want these thoughts. Please take it away. I give it all to you. Help me to shift this perception, purify, use all the words. And all of a sudden, all those thoughts vanished. The anger that I was feeling completely vanished. The, the guilt I was feeling completely vanished. And I came out of that meditation. It was about 20 minutes, 25 minutes. It was like I was a complete different human. Mm -hmm. It was so cleansing. All I could see was this person in her purest perfection. 
I couldn't believe. And I even questioned myself, like, am I making this up? It's like, mm -hmm. no. I'm like, okay, let me try to find. I test myself. I'm like, let me find the anger. I can't find it. Let me find the sadness. I can't find any sadness. And I can oh, I could only see her perfection because that means I also was able the moment to see my own perfection. And it, it's all I do now. When I catch myself with those, what we call negative thoughts or emotions, I just sit and give all to Holy Spirit. Mm. And it's something that has become in a way my daily practice because as I, as all these teachings about the holy relationship resonate so deeply. It's like, it's truth to me. I ask Holy Spirit every single day to help me to unlearn everything that I have learned about relationships in the past, everything, all the distortions about love that I learned. I'm like, I don't want anymore. I mm -hmm. want to unlearn all that. So like you said, so then I can show up in the present moment in the most helpful and loving way and let things unfold. So it's, yeah, this, this, this teachings really, really work. I'm going to say. They do. And I'll tell you one last thing, speaking about, you know, the distress we've been taught to hold in how you feel, you know, it's not, it's not adult or it's not sophisticated or it's not something you must not do that to be very brief. Yes. With whatever distress you've got, you must uh, set aside the stories about what you think it's yep. about. They're in the way and allow yourself to fully feel anger is always going to be at the top of the line. So if, yep. if anger is there, it's the first thing that shows up underneath that or, you know, kind of sadness and despair and hopelessness, all of which means the same thing, but you need to allow yourself to feel those emotions and this is key, with no story attached. You need to set the story aside about what you think it's about because it's never really about what you think it's about. No. <laughs> and that will be in the way. So once your emotional state is settled, then you can look from with different eyes, so to speak, at yep. whatever the issue is. But when there is an issue and there's emotional distress involved, always deal with the emotional distress first because you've got to get your uh, uh, all your brain functioning back online because when you're upset, <clears throat> the stress response turns on, dumps in about 1,200 different hormones into the body, uh, you know, your normal thinking apparatus goes on hold. You, you literally can't think straight. So you need to resolve the chemicals first. Then with a clear mind, you can look at what you have thought the difficulties were about. Thank and you so you do, much for you reminding order, that. I, it's, it's not going to work. Thank you for that. I skipped that part of the story. Yeah. I did scream in the pillow to let them to release the anger. And Perfect. then I allow a couple of tears to come down because underneath the anger, I yeah. found sadness. So I'm so glad you brought this up. Yes. It's never about skipping that stage of letting the charge of the emotions being released. So there's some screaming so pillow sometimes or doing some hard br breath work and allow the tears and then that's where i feel that miracle that shift of perception comes mm -hmm. and it cleanses completely it's it's a moment of healing i call it's like that was very much so very yeah. much so and to try to do it any other way you all you will do is confound yourself because the uh, the distress is kind of in a certain way stored in the body. In other words, and it's uh, you're going to have a mess on your hands if you don't do that first. So good for you that you recognize that I have to do first things first. Then, because as long as I'm got the stress response turned on, uh, I don't I can't think straight. Forty percent of your brain has gone offline. How in the world are you going to be even be able to identify what's the matter if your whole frontal lobe is off? Yeah. And, and with not that said, since we're talking about relationships, what I recommend people to do, because in those moments, it's very easy to want to 
reach out to the person that we have in mind and want them to save us from those emotions. So I always share with people like, go see with those emotions yourself first. Let the charge of those emotions be released. Do your prayer, meditation, ask Holy Spirit, whatever your method is. And then ask yourself if you still want to reach out to that person because it's so easy to blame somebody for those emotions. And like you said, and the Course teaches this over and over, we are never upset about what we think we're upset about. And that's okay. where my work comes in. I help a lot of clients with what we call inner child healing or heal your younger self. At that moment, even though I had a story about one person, I went inside and I found it was an aspect of my 21 year old that needed a little crying. So yeah. it's always something that's stored in our bodies from the past. And I, I, I think I shared this with you before. When I combine that work of releasing the emotions and realizing that it's never about that story in the moment, you combine that with the teachings of the Course in Miracles, that is that is the magic, for the miracle. Mm -hmm. It's like breaking the code. You want to know how to heal? Allow yourself to feel and also bring these teachings, have mm -hmm. some kind of faith and spirit, something bigger than you, because they can go separate. I, I found like if we just focus on the emotions and the trauma, it's incomplete because people keep rotating in that place of always psychology, psychology, psychology. So that's why we need to bring the spiritual aspect. Mm -hmm. And when you bring both, it's like you become you you really become a healer. Like you allow spirit to heal through you. I don't know if I told you when we spoke before, so I will end end our session by get, telling you a yeah. very short story about my grandson, who's now fifteen. But back when he was nine years old, I had come out because it was for his birthday, and he's a super super smart kid. So I thought okay, he's old enough. I'm going to give him the child version of, you know, how the stress response works and so on and so forth. So I'm using what I think is going to work for a not quite nine-year-old. He, he's just having his ninth birthday. He's in the third grade. And so I tell him, you know, when you're really upset and anyway, a, a few preliminary things and all these chemicals are dropped into your body. And I said, and it turns it turns off the front part of your brain and it turns on the back part of your brain. And he sat there and he said, Grandma, that's called the amygdala. And I already know how the stress response works. <laughs> I thought I would fall out of my chair and I ask his mother later, how does an eight-year-old know anything at all about the stress response and much less how it works and she said oh they learned that last year in the second grade in a science unit and it's like oh my gosh well it's a new ball game so at least maybe we're going to raise a generation of kids that know something about this which is you know a positive side but the look on his face like poor grandma doesn't know about this and i'm going to have to educate her that's it was beautiful one of the most hilarious moments I ever lived through. <laughs> oh, this gives me hope because I think like you, we share this belief that every single child should learn about their brain and their stress oh, response. Yeah. What happens when we get flooded with the hormones of stress, the chemicals of stress in our bodies? And I, I think this, yeah, I think children need to be learning all the, the science, well, the psychology, and physiology of stress. Here in Denver are learning about it, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Good. it was one of the unforgettable moments. And it's been lovely to visit with you. So has been yeah. lovely to visit with you, Kara. Thank you for your time. I know your schedule is full with interviews and work with clients, helping people. And again, you're such a role model to me. You you are an incredible friend, beautiful relationship in my life. So before we go, I know you're going to work on a book about relationships. Is there any last message that you want to share with the audience about the beauty and the creation of a holy relationship? I think um, one of the keys, which, which we mentioned, is offer to others what you want to experience. 
because what's in your mind is going to happen for you. So when you're looking for the best in others, or you want to be truly helpful to them, or your um, your approach to them is generous and open hearted, all of that enriches your life over and over and over again. And quite the opposite is true. If you're going to be stingy, if you're going to blame, if you're going to make them the problem, you will just wreck your own peace of mind. Not a good idea. That's a great way of finishing. Giving is receiving. Yeah. Is <laughs> so thank you, beautiful Carol, so much. And I can't wait to have another conversation with you. Many blessings. Bye, dear. <laughs> Bye.